So we've got a brief hour to talk about exponential selling and sales process. So I want to start off with talking about how we define selling. So when we're creating a, a sales culture in our organization, one of the things that I look at is I really believe that sales is largely driven by our intent. So our outlook on selling and our outlook on just human, human beings in general will impact how we interact with them. So you know, if you look at a traditional college textbook around what sales is, they'll define it as something like the exchange of value. You know, the, the use of some definition. And I look at that and think, that's not enough. If I look at sales as just a process of an exchange of value, it's a very impersonal type of interaction. And if that's the belief structure we build the foundation of our sales culture on, it'll impact how we do business. And so for me, I like to define selling a little bit maybe more holistically or sort of bigger picture. And the way I like to define selling is sales is actually about creating an environment where an act of faith can take place. So that's what sales is really about. It's about creating an environment where an act of faith can take place. And faith is really based upon trust. And trust is really based upon credibility. Now, the interesting thing about credibility is credibility is subjective. It's not one size fits all. So I'll give you an example. If you come into my office and you're selling something, if you're a big picture and bottom line, and you like to have a bit of fun and get personal and share some personal stories and ask me some personal questions and we get to know each other, and you keep me out of the nitty gritty, the details, we'll probably have a deal. But if you go into my accountant Dave's office and you do the same thing, he'll ask you to leave. <laughs> because Dave's very detail oriented. He's process oriented. You don't ask Dave personal questions if you don't know Dave, because he doesn't want, it's none of your business. Get to the facts, get to the details. Show me the, the granular aspect of this deal and don't touch me, <laughs> right? And that's Dave, that's Dave's personality. So, so two very different credibility models. And what we look at is our goal, I think, as sales professionals, especially as we sell larger deals and ongoing deals and complex solutions, is that it is about establishing a relationship. And that relationship in business is not just about being likable. I think this is really important, is it's also about being credible. So a good business relationship is likability plus credibility. So I'll give you an example of the difference between likability and credibility. Who here is on Facebook? Right, so almost all of us. Um, and so from a Facebook perspective, we've all got about, let's say, at least 200 connections, most of us on Facebook, right? So at least 100 of those you've met at some point in your life, in, in real life, right? Like probably you've got at least 100, so you've 100. So out of those 100 that you've met in real life, you're obviously Facebook connections because they were likable. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be connected with them. So out of those 100, how many would you trust to invest $20,000 of your hard-earned money? Zero? Anybody? <laughs> You're, one, maybe one, right? So about 1% of the people you know, they're all likable, but 1% is credible. Right? And so that's the real difference between likability and credibility. And so now, Likeability is important too. If you don't like that person, you probably won't give them your money either. So a good business relationship is based upon much like a personal relationship. There's a likeability and connection rapport, but there's a credibility factor as well. And so a lot of it has to do with getting to know and understand each of our customers on an intimate, personal level. Professionally though, don't get like intimate in a weird way with your customers. So Defining exponential selling. So exponential selling, what that's really about, it's a coordinated, achievable series of shifts in your sales process that together create sustainable and significant compound growth for you and your organization. So that's how I like to define exponential selling. It's not about one major shift in many cases. It's actually about a series of small adjustments and ways we can improve our, our sales process, which of course also, uh, you know, after my presentation, we're gonna talk about marketing. And marketing is also about that. It's about iterating and fine tuning. And marketing is an experiment. And I think sales is much an experiment as well, as figuring out what works. So here's a thought. Improving our sales process by 10% in five key areas is the same as increasing our outbound sales calls or increasing our marketing spend on lead generation by 50%. Right, so that's a huge gain, you know? So if we want, again, um, a significant increase, a 50% increase in our business, 
we can improve five areas by 10%, or we can spend 50% more lead, more on marketing. And I like kind of the first option, in my opinion. Right? It's a little bit more cost efficient, to say the least. So I'll give you a quick example, quick math. This is, I know, very like a very sort of trite example of a sales funnel, because our sales funnels are different. But let's say that you get a 200 leads. And of those 200 leads, 60% of them you're actually able to contact. So who gets web-based leads? Forms that fill, right? So they come in. So 60% is a pretty good number. <laughs> so let's say 60% you're actually able to, you actually sent them an email and they replied. Or they actually, you phoned them and they picked up the phone after six attempts, let's say. You finally got them, right? So then out of those 60 120 people left over, 25% of them qualify for and agree to a discovery meeting or call where you actually do a needs assessment. Out of those, 60% of them get a proposal and 45% of our proposals actually end up being a, a first transaction with that client. Okay, so that's not a, a crazy number. And you know, depending on your business, you might be better, you might be a bit worse, but that's that scenario. So imagine if all of a sudden, I don't know, your investor or your boss or head office goes, I need a 50% increase in revenues. So we had a couple options. Option one, of course, and I've seen this a lot in different sales teams, is the sales manager will go, okay, we need a 50% increase in, in sales volume, so get on the phone and make 50% more calls. Go visit 50% more customers. Who here could visit 50% more customers right now with your present workload? Nobody, right? So that's not really an option in most cases, right? So we can increase our deal size, which is one of the things I'll talk about, but the other one is we can also improve our efficiency in the funnel to get a bottom line result. Now, the first one is we could just decide, okay, I'm gonna have 300 leads. Well shoot, now I've got to connect with 180 people on the phone or via email. I've got to now do 45 discovery meetings, and now I've got 27 proposals to write, right? So a lot more proposals, they take time. So finally I close 12. So yeah, so I've now had a 50% increase in my efficiency. Or, on the other side, what if I just improve five things just by 10%, right? So, Instead of 200 leads, marketing dials it up and they deliver 220 leads, right? So 10% improvement, right? Then, instead of having a 60% conversion rate, I now have a 66% conversion rate or a connection rate. Who thinks that they could get just 10% better at maybe reaching out and following up on leads that initially come in? Just 10%, right? So not like a huge groundbreaking shift. Probably dial in a few things, respond a bit faster, change our subject lines, call a different time of day, you know, these things could quickly improve that. Then, let's say that we get a little bit better at our conversations and our discovery meetings. We ask deeper questions. We spend a bit more time connecting with people. And we get just 10% better at writing proposals. Maybe we customize them a bit better. Maybe we take a bit of our needs analysis and make sure it gets in there. Maybe we work on a bit more add-on and upsell with our solution. And then finally, we have a slight increase, a 10% increase in our closing ratio. So what happens now is by just improving five things by 10%, which is a very achievable goal in any aspect of the sales process, I've actually increased my sales by over 50%. So why I share this is this is really what exponential selling is, is about. It's not just about the sales process, but also the sales technology that we leverage to get better at selling. And so I'm gonna share kind of three areas in the next few minutes with you that I feel can really help you exponentially improve the way you sell. So the first thing is I'm going to talk about the three vital components of sales, the successful sales process. So these are three areas that I've identified over the years that almost any organization can focus on and drastically improve the way they sell. The second is the impact of CRM and social media use on quota attainment. So I'm mostly gonna share a few stats and insights from a study I did a little over a year ago along with the Canadian Professional Sales Association on the impact of quota attainment around people who leverage CRM effectively in, in digital sales. And then lastly, I'm gonna kind of walk you through a quick tour of six types of, of SaaS or cloud-based sales solutions. So tools that we can utilize to add to our sales technology stack that makes us more efficient as an organization. So those are three areas we're gonna tackle. This was a one-day seminar, but I compressed it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so here we go. So this was a good quote. This is a quote from one of my clients. Um, he's not in the 
I would say he's not in the, the technology space because he runs a, owns an automotive dealership. But the other thought is that every organization is now a technology organization, right? So all of us leverage technology in our sales process and the way we run our businesses. And so this was an interesting quote. And so this guy uh, owns a dealership called Autoform and they sell pre-owned Aston Martins and Bentleys and high-end AMGs and you name it, lots of Porsches. So pretty cool dealership. And one of the things he said, the owner of the dealership said, is that you can't control people, but you can control the process. So stop trying to control customers, he said. He said, but you can control the steps you're willing to take with the customer. And so in their dealership, there's like six basic steps that they take when someone comes in, from how they greet them, like there's a good and bad way to greet someone when they walk in the door, to the next step is to take them on a tour, then to sit them down at your desk and ask them questions and make sure you understand who they are, then walk them around the car. Then after that, get in the car, take them for a test drive, and then lastly, sit them down at your desk, and send them over to the finance office. Really simple process, but there's best practices at each step. So it was interesting, as we tracked over a period of time, there were certain salespeople who said, yeah, our process works, but you know, these last five customers they didn't want to test drive. So we kind of skipped that, went right to the finance office. Or the first one said, yeah, no, these three, they didn't want to tour. They just wanted to get in the vehicle and test drive it. Now what's interesting is the sales professionals who allowed the customer to tell them what the process was, who was want, the customers wanting to skip steps, like needs analysis, assessment, their closing ratio was about eight out of 100 leads. The sales team that would, the sales members of the team that followed the process, their closing ratio is between 15 and 20 out of 100 leads. So literally 100% improvement in closing ratio. And a lot of it had to do with understanding our process and being willing to follow it. In my business, it's much, you know, one of my big steps in my process, of course, is, um, you know, needs assessment as well. And I'll have people call me up and they want to short circuit the process. They'll go, hi, I heard you speak at conferences. We want to hire you, how much? And I'll go, well, you know, and, and right away, if I get into price right away, which is not part of my process, I'll typically lose them to a cheaper speaker. Maybe he doesn't do such a good job, but they came in lowball. So I force literally the conversation around, well, before we get into that, let me ask me a couple questions about your organization. Right, so I'll do a needs analysis. And then my next step in my process is, I'll, they'll often say, great, send me a proposal. And I'll say, great, it's three pages. <laughs> How long is it gonna take you to read it? And they'll say, oh, it'll probably take me about 10 minutes. I said, fantastic. I said, so if I get it to you tomorrow, would Thursday be a good time to hop on the phone and review the outline? And I literally, in my process, won't send a proposal unless someone commits to a follow-up time. One of the reasons why I know is if I don't, I chase proposals for weeks and months. And someone says, well, what happens if they refuse to give you a follow-up time? I said, I refuse to write a proposal. They say, but you'll lose a deal. I'll say, well, no, I, I'm, that's, don't worry about the deal you're losing that you don't have already, right? <laughs> like, you don't have the deal anyways. You haven't lost it because you're not gonna get it unless you follow the process. And so it's really important to understand your process. And I'll, you know, even for this, for, I've got another client, someone will say, I've only got 20 minutes for the call. And our answer is, well, this takes about 45. So let's see how far we can get in 20 minutes, and then we'll book a follow-up call to do the rest of the meeting. So being not rigid, but understanding how, to, how your sales process works and what helps you win is really important. So sales process ROI. This is a stat from Harvard Business Review. Um, back in 2015, which is like a century ago in today's, day, in today's stats, right? But some good interesting stats and studies did it on sales process. And they found that sales forces were most effective at managing their sales pipelines if they had invested time in defining a credible, formalized sales process. In fact, there was an 18% difference in revenue growth between companies that defined a formal sales process and companies that didn't. Now what's interesting with missing in this stat is there's like four or five paragraphs in between because it's really long, it wouldn't fit on a slide, is it talked about it's not just enough to also have a process, but as sales leaders, coaching our people to the qualitative aspects of the process, helping them get better at each step. Not just say, make more calls, 
but say, let's sit down together and listen to your calls. Let's work on how we can improve them, right? And actually coaching people to those processes. So talking about process, there's three areas I'm gonna focus on today. And when I go in and do a sales audit in an organization and look at their process and what's happening, I find first off that these are the three biggest quick wins I can have in an organization. I'll go in and look at their quality and consistency of lead flow, their quality and depth of conversations with customers, and their quality and tenacity of follow-up. And most organizations are missing one or more of these things. So especially quality and tenacity of follow-up. I've never in the last five years gone into an organization and said, the challenge with your sales team is they follow up too much. <laughs> I have not said that to anybody. Because uh, the reality is, is that it's, it's a very common issue is the follow-up process. And so having a systematic value-added pro process to make sure we're converting our leads at the maximum. So let's start off with criteria. So here's an example of vague criteria. Someone says to me, hey, Shane, I'd like to send you some business. What type of customers are you looking for? And I'm like, well, I'm looking for big organizations, which is a very subjective term, uh, that need sales training. How, how focused are those leads going to be? All right, pretty low. And so I think too often, this is I'm looking for organizations that have needs in these specific areas technically. Well, again, it's pretty vague. Where are they located? What's their stage of business growth? What's the culture of the organization? What's their attitudes toward technology? Um, you know, have I done business in their space before? Um, do I have access to decision makers? These are all things that begin to define whether they're an ideal candidate. So if you said to me, hey, Shane, what type of clients are you looking for? And I said, well, I'm actually looking for SaaS companies with 20 plus salespeople in Vancouver, Toronto, Edmonton, or Calgary, 20 million plus revenues per year, sells B2B solutions and products, is growing or in transition, and has direct access and I, to decision makers, where I can actually connect and talk to someone who makes a decision. Who would say my leads are, would be a little bit better, right? I'd get fewer leads, but my ROI, these are the 20 percenters that give me 80% of my business, right? In that segment, I've got like five verticals I focus on. So the question I ask is if you sat down within your own team, and you asked everybody that you worked with, who's our ideal customer, would you have a uniform answer? Have you actually built a clear definition of who your ideal customer is in each segment? Because in most cases, we haven't. And this is where we get into quality and frequency, like quality of leads and consistency of leads. We need to understand this first in order to help marketing focus, right? But we also need it to understand where to put our time. Because a lot of times we can just react to what's coming in, right? And versus looking at creating abundance in our business through proactive time. And that's the key factor is that our wealth building time as entrepreneurs and as salespeople is our proactive time. So we maybe work, we maybe have 12 hours in a day we work or 10 hours in a day we work, and maybe eight of them are reacting to other people. People calling, people inviting us out to meetings, customers asking us questions. All these types of things, internal meetings, entering data, all these things take up time. And then in that one hour a day that you have, where are you investing that one hour? Is it in the 20% of the business or market that gives you 80% of your business proactively? And the reason why is the rest of the day, the world says, I'm your customer. But in your proactive time is when you decide you're in front of your computer and say, who am I going to call? Who am I going to reach out to? What am I going to do? And that's where you can really define your market. So one of the things around process that's important is really organizing your customer database. So I've heard that you know, there's different CRMs being used. I've heard a few people here are using Zoho CRM. Is there a few Zoho users, right? right? Any Dynamics users? Anybody use Microsoft Dynamics? Yeah, so Dynamics users. So Salesforce users, anybody? No Salesforce users? Okay, so we use varying degrees of it, but I think the important part is within our CRM is actually to segment our customers. So when they come in, it's not just a list of 1,800 prospects that we're digging through but it helps us build our strategy. So this is one of the ways that I like to help my customers build their process, my clients, is that we take our clients, number one, and we break them down under A, B, and C. So A's are absolutes. These give us 80% of our business. B's are beneficial. They're great clients, but maybe they don't pay quite as frequently. <laughs> uh, maybe the orders are slightly smaller. Maybe we have to really do a ton of customization so it takes more energy. Maybe they're just high maintenance. Maybe they're a bit further to drive 
because you have to physically go see them sometimes. So all these things might make them not ideally, ideally an A, but they're still a B. And then your C is convenient. And so I look at, um, if I go to a networking function, my A's, when I meet them, the next day they get a phone call and an email. My B's, they'll probably get a nice to meet you email. And my C's, I see them at the next conference. Because <laughs> it's really not worth the ROI to kind of reach out to them. And so what we start off with is A's are high investment from a relationship perspective, and they're high yield. And they're highly customized in our interaction and personalized, because they need it to close them and to keep them. Then as we move down, our C's are where we want automation, right? So e-commerce solutions, right? Self-serve type options to kind of deal with large numbers without a huge personal time impact. And then we've got four categories. So the first one is retain. So under our A's, we need a strong retain strategy. And I always look at like a marriage. So I got friends who say, oh, it's not like it used to be in my marriage. And they've been married like four years. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> right? And I'm like, okay, that's it. you're just getting started, but that's okay. So why, and, and my first question will be, are you doing the same things you did four years ago in the relationship? Right, to keep it fresh, to keep it exciting, keep it romantic, keep it new. And also the answer is, well, not really, because they just expect them to be home when they get there. Right, and I think that's really important with clients is the same thing, is that have they been cutting checks to us or paying us automatically every month for the last two years, and they were a really exciting client, but now they're on the books. And once in a while we reach out and find out if they want to buy anything else, and they get a Christmas card, but we really don't have a retention strategy in to protect and grow that customer. Then our, our develops are clients that, you know, maybe they could spend $100,000 a year with us, but right now they're spending nine and they're spending the rest with a whole bunch of other suppliers, plus they've got a whole bunch of unmet technology needs they don't even know they need. And so we need a develop strategy. And the three things that happen in develop, if you want to develop a client, typically is number one, your knowledge of them has to increase. You have to understand their organizational structure, their business challenges, where their industry is heading, and really just get to know them. And I don't know of any way to really do that. It's not LinkedIn, that's not going to help you, <coughs> maybe a little bit largely sitting down with them and having a conversation, a powerful conversation. Then their knowledge of you has to increase. What is all the ways microwage can impact their business? Do they know and understand that? Are they well educated? And third is that personal relationship has to grow too. All right? So, you know, people say, oh, gone are the days that you, know, you take someone for a game of golf and build a relationship. You know, it's all digital now. I disagree. I think it's a good merger of both. You still need to connect with people on their personal level plus leverage digital to get things done. And then lastly, the next two is the regain and gain. So regain is to gain back customers we've lost. By the way, who here has ever lost a customer and you've gone, thank God? Anybody? <laughs> right, so I'm not talking about that guy, but I'm talking about the one that was a great customer, but you could no longer meet their technology needs. And now MicroAge has a bunch of solutions that you can go back with something new and knock on the door and actually meet those needs. Or maybe there was a budget issue. Maybe they were turned down for credit, but things have shifted. Maybe you didn't get along with somebody that worked in their office, but now there's a new person there. So there's a bunch of reasons why, if they're an A, you might want to regain them. And one of the things you want to do with a regain strategy largely is have something new. Own up to problems if there were in the past, but then always knock on the door with something new. Now, it might be that you're new, right? Maybe you're the new face of the organization in that area, right? or you've got new technology, or something's changed in their industry where you can impact them differently. And then lastly is the gain strategy, which is the most expensive thing we'll ever do other than lose a customer. It costs about between five and 12, depending on the industry, between five and 12 times more to gain a customer than it is to retain the equivalent revenue from an existing customer. It's expensive. Talk to marketing, right? The number of, of people we have to interact with and engage and talk to and, and embrace, and the number of times that we need to interact with them before they even fill out a form or reach out to us is pretty high. So those costs are very high. And so with our gain strategy, in my opinion, it's really important to live in our A zone, especially with our personal time. All my proactive calls and energy has to be with my A category prospects. So this is not necessarily the way you have to organize your database or your CRM, but this is how I like to organize it to keep me focused. Because you can't follow up everybody. Who here has ever beat themselves up after a conference or a trade show because you got a ton of cards and you just didn't get back to all of them in time? 
Anybody? No, oh, no one's never fallen off with a lead in this room. That's amazing. Uh, I have. Okay, so um, I've, <laughs> I've gone, and I'm like, oh, man, you know, I got 100 business cards, and by the time I get back to the office and unpack and everything else, I only get back to 20 of them. I'm a horrible salesperson. But the reality is maybe you should only be following up with 20 or 30 of them, at least on an intense level, because 20 or 30 of them were A's, and the other 70s were C's. And it's okay to send them a generic email and put them on your list and nurture them and focus on the high ROI opportunities. So that's my kind of piece around targeting criteria. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, a number of years ago, we worked with a, a bank in South Africa. And we worked with their commercial bankers. And we had them do the ABCs of targeting and define their client criteria. And so one of the, the support steps was we actually went in and sat with the bankers and made sure they actually implemented it properly. And we looked down on here, and just by chance with this one banker, I looked down and I saw under C retain one of our A clients. I said, this is weird. I said, this, like, this is a very good client of ours. They've got bucks, like, and they're, they're rocking. I don't understand how this could be a C for a bank, unless they know something I don't know. And so and this is probably like a one in 10,000 chance that I would see a client on a list that like, they had as well. And I'm pretty sure we broke some privacy rules as well, but oh well, I, I didn't know that at the time. Uh, and so I asked him, I said, tell me about this prospect here. Why is this guy a C? Just curious. I said, what criteria do you use? He said, oh, really simple. He says, I looked at the net revenues to the bank last year and how much time, energy that I had to put into this guy. And he said, and this guy only has a merchant credit card account, but his clients are mostly cash and carry. I'm pretty sure they're like a, a fencing and wiring company. And which is pretty big business in a lot of Africa, as fencing and wiring and security and whatnot. Um, and, uh, and he said, so, you know, he said, uh, you know, really, most of his clients would probably pay cash or bank transfer, and we never see any transactions. So we don't make a lot of money off this guy. And he said, plus, he says, he's always sending me these stupid joke emails. And then he's phoning me up, and he wants to talk about rugby and cricket and the weather. And he said, like, he gets annoying. I have to, like, cut him off and get him off the phone. I said, oh, I said, well, that, yeah, that sounds like a, I can see where that would be a C. And I said, let me ask you a question. What if I told you his wife owns the fastest growing coffee franchise in South Africa? He said, well, that'd be different. I said, what if I also told you that he owns the land beside that address there and he wants to build another manufacturing plant? He goes, well, that would be really different then. I said, what if I also told you that he owns a home in Kluth, which is just outside of Durban, which is a very prestigious kind of area, just kind of his second house to Holiday Inn. He said, this is not a hypothetical question, is it? I said, no. I said, it's one of my clients. He said, ah. Oh. I said, uh, and, I, and it was interesting, is that that wasn't actually a C retain. What was it? An A develop. It was someone else's A, right? And probably an underserved A. So here's a guy who wants to build a relationship with them, <laughs> and he's shutting them down and hanging up the phone. Why did he miss? Why did he miss the opportunity? He didn't dig deeper, right? And what he was missing, too, is he didn't dig deeper, absolutely, and he was missing the criteria. He was only using two, which was important, net revenues and, and the amount of time, but he didn't look things like assets, influence, other business en enterprises, stage of business growth. He looked at none of that, and so he missed the A. And so I think it's really important is as you're building your criteria and looking at your market that you use enough criteria, five to seven good ones, to help you really identify who your A, Bs, and Cs are. So, because here's, the, here's the Vern Harnish who wrote the book, uh, Rockefeller Habits. Um, I forget when he said this, if I read it in his book or I saw him speak and he said it, but he said success is more about subtraction than addition or multiplication in business. It's actually about cutting out all the things that don't look like your core business strategy the activities, the distractions, the unqualified prospects. And so I think really understanding who your A's are in each segment will help drive your process. So then we talk, beyond having a really good process for qualifying and focusing on and driving business, is the art of asking questions. So the second part of sales process that's really vital is truly getting to understand the other customer, understand the customer and to connect with them. And so I came across this concept because I was really bad at it at first. And so I, one of my first sort of big gigs was in my early 20s, and I got a contract to go down to South Africa and launch a direct sales company there. And so, you know, literally, like, 
Back then, it was a pretty big laptop. <laughs> it was heavy. Uh, but you know, on a plane and off to Africa with me and my laptop and an expense budget, and I went down and I had to launch this company down there. And mostly recruiting. So I was standing on stage with audiences of this size, up to four or 500 people, and presenting this business idea. And in the audience, 20% of the guests that were there would sign up for direct sale, this direct sales company. It's not a bad closing ratio, right? So that's 20% closing ratio from the stage. But some people couldn't make it to the meetings, so some of the leads that came in from overseas, I had to go see one-on-one. -on -one. So if my closing ratio from stage is 20%, what was my closing ratio in person at that time? Pardon? 15, 50. Your first guess was closer. It was like almost 5%. I was horrible at closing in person. Now, I couldn't figure out why. I just, because, you know, for me, if I wasn't getting the results, I would just do the same thing harder, <laughs> faster, more of it, right? Call more people. But I was driving from Johannesburg to Durban, and I was listening to like a motivational CD. And you have to listen to a lot of motivational CDs if your closing ratio is 1 out of 20. Uh, and so I was listening to a lot of motivational CDs, and I'm like, all right, I'm like, what's, go what's wrong with me? And finally, it was like somewhere between Durban and Johannesburg, I'm driving along, and this speaker talks about um, Dale Carnegie's book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, but he talked about great salespeople listen 70% of the time, and they ask really good questions and offer great insights 30% of the time. And I thought, this is like a pull the car over moment. And I'm like, ah, I know where I've been blowing it. I've been giving them the same enthusiastic talk about all my products and stats and company and just like throwing up in their office basically all this data and I wasn't listening. So what I did is I realized I had a problem. And, and it, by the way, when you get nervous if you're a talker and you're in sales, what do you do more of when you get nervous? You talk, right? So the worse the sale was going, the more I'd talk. So that became a real issue. So what I did is on the corner of every page of all my manuals and all my notebooks that I would draw numbers on and communicate, I drew a little hourglass. And, it's, and that little hourglass to me reminded me, listen. In addition to that, I also developed a series of questions that even after I'd done it 100 times, I still used the written down questions that I would ask each segment. Started off with general questions, went down to questions that told a story, and then down to more specific, confidential ones. So it was a specific process. Start general, move into questions that begin to tell a story, and then lastly is kind of the key hard questions you need to ask. And the key here is a good needs analysis is you know the story, but instead of telling the customer the story, you ask them questions, you get them to narrate the story. So they hear themselves talking about why they need what we have. All right? And so it was interesting as I started doing this, and strange things happened. Halfway through, the present, halfway through the conversation, before I even told them all the great facts about us, they said weird things like, can I bring a friend? <laughs> How do I start? Do I get to work with you? And I'm like, wow, this is way different than the very uncomfortable situation I had before, where people were paying me just to be quiet. That, that's why. I think that one out of 20 was signing up because they wanted me to stop talking. Um, and so it really, really shifted the way I sold. And it's had a big impact even today. Today, I still, even though I do what I do and I've done it for years, I still have a written needs analysis. Keeps me on track. I don't forget the questions. All right? It shows the customer I'm listening. And it's a great record for people who I'm working with. And it gets a lot easier to put the data in my CRM after if I've got it organized. And so my suggestion is you need a strong needs analysis tool do you use to force you to systematically listen and get deeper in our conversations? And I'll talk about one last little piece here around conversations is that when a customer says, you know, so let's say they need a, a certain solution. They say, look, I want to migrate this part of my business onto the cloud and we've got other offices we're going to move in, launching and it's going to make more sense to do it now than later. Okay, fantastic. And so you could write that down and say, okay, that's their motivation. Or I could ask, so why, is it, why do you feel it's important to do it now instead of later? And they'll say, well, I don't want to be playing catch up and be you know, multiplying the cost later on and burning up time. And, and so why is time an issue for you right now? 
you say time's an issue, what does that mean? And they give me a deeper answer. Well, I'm an entrepreneur and I work 18 hours a day and I wanna build my business so that I can spend more time with my family and have better health. I'm like, wow, okay, so they're thinking cloud and I'm thinking features and benefits from the supplier and they're thinking family and health and leverage. And so I think too often we don't dig deep enough to go that family health and leverage is actually the outcome they're buying. So John Ferreira, who founded Nimble CRM, one of my favorite quotes from John is, people don't buy products or services, they buy better future versions of themselves and their business. And I think if we get deep enough, we have the leverage when we're writing our proposals, when we're following up, when we're upselling, to truly understand what motivates our customer. So once we've had these deeper conversations, I wanna talk a little bit about the third piece, which is tenacity and quality of follow-up. So here's an interesting stat about web-based leads. So this study was actually done, um, well, InsideSales.com is where I pulled this data from, but the actual study was done by Dr. James Oldroyd. And they literally went, because um, uh, Inside Sales is like an inbound call center CRM, and they're able to track thousands of calls, and the forms on the websites inter inter integrate directly with the CRM. So when it comes in, they know who got it, when it was filled out, and then what the closing ratio was, because it's all the, it's a closed loop. And so what they did is they studied and looked at with dozens and dozens of countries, or companies, thousands of salespeople and in inbound inquiries. And here's what they found. The odds of contacting a new lead is 100 times greater within five minutes versus 30 minutes. And that's a web-based lead. Odds of entering the sales process are 20 to 21 times greater when contacted within five minutes versus 30. Interesting. So the logic is, of course, if you're sitting at your computer and you got five tabs open and you're looking at six different companies and you're looking for a specific solution, you're filling out forms, you're in the zone. And you're probably sitting at your desk, right? Or at least in front of your mobile phone, you know, but your, your attention is there. So any, now if that's the stats, what's, what was the average response time? If five minutes is optimal, now your business, you might test, maybe it's three hours is optimal, but five minutes, 24 hours, it's 24 hours you meant, right? Yeah, it was actually 72. So you talk about wasted marketing spend. All that energy we spend building our websites and building brand, and then our average response time was 72 hours. Now part of me thinks it's because sometimes if marketing and sales don't talk about what an A lead is, like so that we both agree what an 80-20 lead is, a good lead, then it's just G thanks leads. Who's ever got G thanks leads? That's where the, the, the service or marketing team goes off to a trade show and they bring us back a bunch of leads and we go, G thanks. Because <laughs> they're totally unqualified, right? So that's part of it. But the other one is rapid response, right? And so this is web-based leads. Not necessarily like a guy you meet at an event and a business card and phone him five minutes later, but web-based leads. So we did this back to that same car dealership I was dealing with. And the way they were handling the leads is the leads would come from the website and go to the marketing team. The marketing team would then pre-qualify them. And they would actually reach out and send an email and see what was going on. And then after they were qualified, they'd give it to the sales manager who would look around and see who deserved the lead. <laughs> right? And they, sometimes the guy, the top salespeople, they'd all give the lead to the top sales guy. But the sales guy's on a test drive. Or they're not at work that day. So this lead would just sit there for days and significantly low conversion rate. So what we did is we changed the process. And we said, okay, when the lead comes in, the marketing is in the same office as the sales team. Marketing walks out of their office and goes, who's on the floor that doesn't have a customer? Herb, got a customer right now? No, sending you a lead. Three minutes, you got it, you're on the phone calling them. Conversion ratios went up double digits, right, from the lead to appointment. So rapid response can make a real big difference in our business. So, and the question is, how much do I follow up? When is a lead dead? When can I give up? When can I put my head on the pillow at night and go, I did a good job. I don't have, to, pardon? When they say yes or no. So that's my belief as well. And so I, I typically, and, and so that's, but as a minimum, let's take a look at, um, so Velocify, another CRM-like platform that along with the sort of cus anonymized customer data, looked at the number of follow-ups, the type of follow-ups, and the odds of someone entering the sales funnel. And what they found 
is on your first follow-up attempt, 48% of the people that will enter your sales funnel will enter it. Meaning that if only 20% ever enter your sales funnel, 48% of those would enter within the first contact. On the second contact, 70%. On the third, 81. On the fourth, 86. On the fifth, 90. And 93% of all people that would ever enter your sales funnel enter it by the sixth. Now there is another 10% that you could continue to follow up with, but that's what like marketing lead nurturing programs can do as well, account-based marketing. But the key here is that this is the number of attempts. And what they found is, at least generically across multiple industries, and a lot of these were technology-based solutions, is the window was about two weeks, but three follow-ups in the first day, right? So a phone call, a voicemail, and a text, or some kind of a variation of that can work quite well. And then a couple of days later, you might reach out with another email. And then at the end of the week, a phone call. And the following week, a couple more touches. And they found that that kind of scenario really worked to get people into the sales funnel. So another question, where did the average salesperson quit? If this data is true, but where does the average salesperson in their study quit? Three, two, 2.2. Was kind of I don't know who the point two customer is, but uh, but two point two. So just just slightly over two attempts, and they're leaving thirty percent of the potential revenues on the table. So if you want to be above average, follow up three times. <laughs> like literally, that would just get you above average. And then if you really want to win, have a process for five or six times. And if you've got a sales team, give them tools, give them white papers, give them cool studies, give them interesting approaches, right? Give them different ways to engage creatively so that they have a reason to reach out. So then, once they're in the funnel, here's some interesting thoughts on lead nurturing. Now for me, lead nurturing just simply means not hide you wanna buy, hide you wanna buy, hide you wanna buy, just touching base, just touching base, are you ready? That's not follow up, that's no value add. All right, but it's hey, um, maybe they're in manufacturing and you go, hey, found this great study on um, how IoT is impacting manufacturing, thought you'd find it interesting. Away it goes. So that's a value-added contextual piece of information. So a nudist group, and I always love when I say this, it sounds like I'm saying nudist group, so I gotta be very careful. It's a nudist group, did a study, and what they found was that nurtured leads, those that have value-added follow-up over time, make 47% larger purchases than non-nurtured leads. And according to Forrester Research, companies that excel at lead generation generate 50% more sales leads at a 33% lower cost per lead. So pretty fascinating. So when we look at this, is that do we have a process where every third week with an A category prospect, I reach out somehow and add value? Invite them to an event, send them a white paper. If you're in their area, drop by their office, right? Bring them with the VIP functions, send them a lead, these are all, or if they're active on LinkedIn and writing stuff, like it, comment on it, thank them. These are all ways that we can actually begin to nurture leads. And by doing this, it'll increase our conversions. We talk about, it really impacts the bottom end of our funnel. So I'll briefly talk about these stats here. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this today, but as a sales leader in your organization, coaching is vital. So it's great we have these best practices and we want people to listen and and they want them to target, want them to follow up, but we need to coach them to these things. So here's some thoughts on coaching. Is, and this is from CSO Insights and Salesforce. They found that sales teams who use sales performance coaching had 16% more wins, 161% more wins, excuse me, close, and close rates increased by 17%. Teams that receive three plus hours of coaching per month average 100% of target on average. So sales coaching, whether you hire an external organization to work with you or internally, you said, and it's, it's this simple, a quick sales coaching audit is, if you're a sales leader, sales manager, business owner, am I spending an hour a month of quality time with each of my sales team members, coaching them on how to get better? Not just what are your numbers, but how are we improving the numbers in your process? And if we can't answer at least no to that, then I don't think we're doing the bare minimum we need to to improve our team, all right? So let's talk about CRM. Now, who here offers CRM as a solution to some of your clients? Right? So a few of us, okay, excellent. So uh, Canadian Professional Sales Association, which is a 20,000 member organization across Canada of sales professionals, um, I partnered with them and we did a study of some of their members plus some of my clients and said, 
what are their closing ratios or their or success compared to the people who use it and those that don't? It's a very simple survey. We said, do you use social media? How many times a day do you use it for business? And the other one was, do you use a CRM? And then the third question is, did you m hit, miss, or make quota last year? And then we looked at kind of what these results showed. Here's what we found. 84.28% of respondents actually had a CRM in place. Of those, 72% met or exceeded quota. Now, I think that part of it is they had it in place. Not all of them were using it effectively, but they had one in place. 87% of salespeople who don't use a CRM missed quota. So of the goals handed down to them from their team, 87% missed quota in Canada. 34% used Salesforce, and then Microsoft Dynamics was number two, and then everybody else kind of almost had an equal amount as far as in the small business space. So bottom line is, if you're not using a CRM, adopt one. But here's the key factor, build your process first. CRM itself only measures what you're doing, and so you need a process. Lastly is social selling. So we found that 86.46% of respondents access social media at least once a day for business. That's pretty high. And 90% of those met or exceeded quota. 50% of people who didn't use social media at all in their sales process, no LinkedIn, no Facebook, no Twitter, that wasn't part of their process, they're just like emailing and texting and phone and that's it, missed quota. Those that use it for work one to three times a day outperform non-users and those that use it five plus times a day. So let's talk about that. So people who use it for work one to three times a day did better than those that didn't use it, but also did it better than those that overused it. So there is such a thing as social not working. <laughs> Instead of social networking, we're just social not working. We're spending way too much time curating our network, adding friends, look, look at all the likes I've got on LinkedIn on my post, but they're not actually proactively, systematically having something they do three times a day in an organized way. So that's kind of the sweet spot. So what I want to finish off here with, and I know I've kind of thrown a lot all with you already, is I want to talk about your sales technology stack. And just sort of a quick tour. Now there are, there used to be about 300 um, sales SaaS companies in North America. And that was back in 2010. A few years back that grew to 2,000 and today it's over 5,000 different companies selling software solutions SaaS-based, cloud-based solutions to sales organizations. So I, I feel bad for any VP of sales who's got to figure out what tool am I going to use. So I can't tell you exactly what you need to use for your business, but I thought I'd share the major categories and just pick one of my favorites from each category and briefly talk about it. So building your sales technology stack. Well, number one, it starts with CRM. We've got to pick a CRM. But we've also got to pick one that enables the rest of these processes as well, that has some type of plug-in or integration. So CRM, lead generation, contact enrichment, email intelligence, sales workflow, social selling, and artificial intelligence are kind of seven big pieces of our sales technology stack. So what I would say here is number one, you will, I see you guys taking pictures, which is awesome. I'll, I'll do a pose as well. Um, uh, but um, but uh, I know you'll get a copy of the deck as well. So you'll get a copy of this deck. So let's talk about CRM. So this is just mostly from the data that CPSA and I gra gathered, plus some of my own personal preference. I mentioned Zoho earlier, which is a really great solution. Um, you know, one of the things is the, the ongoing maintenance cost is a lot lower than a lot of these tools, and it's pretty customizable, and it gives you a full kind of integrated office suite. But Microsoft Dynamics, um, Salesforce is the, kind of the two big ones. What I love about Salesforce is their app exchange and all the things that can plug into it. And so you're able to, in many cases, versus customize, personalize. So versus spending all kinds of money with a custom build, you can personalize it by adding tools that third parties make for it around social selling or any other, or connect it with your ERP or you name it. So Nimble for small business is the one I use for my own business. And what I like about it is it's really built for social media. So it tracks all my major conversations online, plus an email, and puts it all in one spot, and I can look at your and my interactions on Twitter and from three different email addresses all in one spot, plus see where our deals are at and what's happening from an accounting perspective. So these three tools I like because they're social and they integrate with most other tools. Um, and if they don't do it sort of natively, um, Zapier often has a workaround with them. So I, anybody use Zapier, Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R? So a great tool to plug your tools together. So then we've got 
lead generation and management. So obviously Sales Navigator, LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a great sort of lead management tool. So if you're using LinkedIn to prospect, it's a great way you can organize, tag, and keep tabs on clients. So for instance, I'll give you an example. I had uh, one client who was a prospect at the time, and I had them in, once I put them in LinkedIn Sales Navigator, I put his first and last name and followed him, plus his company, and anything, anytime on the internet something happens with that business that's on the newswire or within LinkedIn, LinkedIn emails me and says, XYZ company has just gone through a merger, or they've promoted somebody, or they've just got funding, or whatever's happening. So LinkedIn Navigator notified me that the VP of sales had been promoted to president, which was kind of great because the block on the deal was the president <laughs> at that time, so that kind of helped. But in addition to that, they just bought another company. And it literally hit the newswire, and within minutes, I was able to, because LinkedIn had told me, sent him an email, and all it said was, congratulations. Hey man, I know how hard you've been working, amazing on your promotion, and congratulations on that merger, that's amazing, that's a big win. That was it, it wasn't, hey, do you wanna buy now? <laughs> uh, and what's interesting is he responded right away and said, thanks so much. He goes, both of them, bit of a surprise to be honest. I guess the board had a different plan than he knew of. And he said, but it's time we grab lunch again. And a few weeks later, I was doing business with them. And so it's really interesting that it can actually help manage and monitor your network. Outreach I won't get into, but it's a sales workflow tool for lead management, so you can plan multiple campaigns with it. So contact enrichment and intelligence. So tools like Inside View or Datanize, what I like about it is, and Nimble has this built in as well, is maybe I have your email address and your first and last name, but I'd like to phone you. I can actually click on a button, and Nimble will say, you know, I've got a 92% probability that this is your phone number, do you wanna buy it? I click yes, and I can purchase that phone number within the system and call you immediately. So this is, or for instance, maybe all I have is your email address, and Nimble or Inside View will tell me your Twitter handle, your LinkedIn profile, your Facebook business page, other data about you and your work history, and I can pull it into my CRM automatically. So that can save me like minutes per prospect, but hours per day and days per year in the sales process. So think about do you have a contact enrichment tool that you could use for prospecting or client research? Email intelligence. So email intelligence tools, tools like who uses Yesware or HubSpot or one of these email intelligence tools? So here's how it works. I could, uh, let's say I send a follow up to Maria uh, and uh, maybe I had a question for her and I noticed she answered it or she opened it up but she didn't respond. And then I call her and she says, hey, not right now, Shane, but uh, you know, maybe later. And then it, all of a sudden it's two, three months down the road because <laughs> we've been back and forth and we, uh, things have fallen off. And all of a sudden, she opens the email again to review the document I sent. Guess what happens? I get, a, I get a message from my email system saying, Maria just opened your outline for your program you proposed. I pick up the phone and I say, Hi, and she's at her desk, of course, because she just opened this thing, and she says, hello, hi, Shane. I go, yeah, I was just thinking of you. And she goes, that was weird. I was thinking of you, too. I was just reading your proposal, right? And so um, don't be creepy about it, <laughs> but I've used this multiple times where a deal's gone dead, and I haven't heard anything from anybody for a while, and all of a sudden, they open my proposal up three months later. And I call them in the moment they're reviewing it, and often it's an entry point. So it tells me who's opened it and when, and so it's a really good way to manage opportunities that way. And if they've gone back and like opened it seven times, I know they're really thinking this thing over. And so this is a really good tool. It can also tell me what links they click in my email individually. So much like an email marketing tool, but for individual sales. Sales workflow. One of my clients is a nonprofit, and they used Salesforce and Sales Loft. And what they did is they have five market segments. They planned out those touches I talked about, almost like a little campaign, with templates, value-added stuff they can send through, the questions for the needs analysis, and it literally just runs the sales team. He kind of laughs, he's like, I don't tell my boss, but I don't think they need me anymore. <laughs> he goes, because the team just runs through sales loft, they know what to do next with each step, and it's triggered literally by the client activities. And so sales workflow can track all your steps and drive it automatically. Membrane is a tool that plugs into Dynamics and Salesforce that actually helps you uh, manage complex sales in the same fashion. So moving quickly, I talked a lot about social selling, but here's what I'll say. Um, 
One of the things that we miss for opportunities, I think the biggest underused social networking tool right now is Slack. People are using Slack within their teams, but what many people don't know is how many public Slack channels are out there where your target market, people in the technology space, in the marketing space, business owners, are in there interacting, much like a Facebook group, but without all the garbage. Very professional. And so if, you're not, if you haven't looked at public Slack channels, check them out. So let's talk about artificial intelligence, and I'm gonna wrap this up. I know I'm gonna go over a little bit, but uh, no one's counting the seconds, right? I got a second? Or, so, so AI, who's heard a little bit about artificial intelligence lately, right? So we all talk about it. Everybody's got some type of artificial intelligence-based tool that'll help us. So I think there's a lot of hot air and fluff around it, but there's also a lot of reality around how AI is impacting the way we do business. So this is a quote from Mark Benoit, who of course is the CEO of Salesforce. He said, we're in an AI spring. I think for every company, the revolution in data science will fundamentally change how we run our businesses because we're going to have computers aiding us in how we're interacting with customers. And I think that's a good definition, is good AI will actually aid us in how we're interacting with our customers. So this is kind of an interesting stat from McKinsey. Roughly half of today's work activities, including large numbers of white collared roles, could be automated by 2055. Now, some people read that as half of all jobs, but no, it's half of all the things you're doing in your job will be automated, right? And we see this in the home with Alexa and tools like that. And I think, you know, the millennials in particular who are used to these tools at home are really comfortable using them in the office. And so I think we're gonna see a lot of Alexa-like tools that help salespeople be better. Don't replace us, but all of a sudden, all the stuff I talked about, like contact enrichment tools and follow-up and process, they're actually gonna ride shotgun with us and do that stuff for us so we can do more of what we're good at, which is talking to customers. I like this study, this state mostly from Gabe Larson. This, I like this analogy. So is in Iron Man, you've got a gentleman who puts on a suit and becomes a superhero. We wanna do that with sales. We wanna take the subjective salesperson who is guessing about what they should do and how they should do it and encapsulate that with a machine so that they become superior salespeople. So with the inside sales, they tracked salespeople who were willing to take coaching from the CRM. There's AI based upon it. They looked at customer behaviors and similar customers and what they needed. And they said, your next step should be this. The salespeople who did that versus the ones that just manually used their sales system, their CRM, the ones that enabled the AI coaching had a 20% higher win rate. And Salesforce, with their Einstein tool, did recent study and found about the same results. So, I'll share one of my favorite tools, and then I'll wrap up with this. Um, there's a bunch, like Gong actually listens to your sales team's phone calls, tracks their speech patterns, and will tell you how much they're talking versus customers are talking. And they found very much similar to my 70-30 rule, that they found that salespeople who talk less than their customers significantly close more deals. They also found that salespeople who talked about price at the end of the conversation close more deals. So they can look at that data, do the speech analysis, and spit out a report of your 20 salespeople and say, these five are on plan, these two are talking too much. And then you can, instead of like having to listen to hours of phone calls to figure out what's going on, you can read the transcript and then sit down with the salesperson and say, let's talk about how to get better. So kind of scary, kind of cool. Um, so Crystal Nose is a really cool tool. So anybody try Crystal Nose? So who's ever taken a disk assessment or personality profile? Right? So who found that they were relatively, or scary, in a scary way, um, accurate about our personality style, right? So somewhat, right? So what Crystal Nose does is it analyzes speech patterns or, or writing patterns. So when someone sends me an email, I've got it turned on in my browser, and it'll look at their talk, what they're saying, how they write, the type of words they use, the level of brevity or the strength of the words they use, and it'll spit out a personality profile. It then even suggest on a follow, I'll click follow up email, it'll suggest the generic text of what a follow up email should be for this personality profile. And then of course I can add additional data as I get to know the client better around their profile. So really interesting way. Um, I, I took one of Donald Trump's speeches and I put it in there and then analyzed it. Uh, don't do that, don't do that. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, there is a narcissism category in there and it was pretty high, I'm just saying. Um, and so, uh, but it's a really cool tool. Well, 40 bucks a month, and you can use it to coach you on how to sell the different personality styles, AI-based. So that's an example of some of the tools that are available out there. 
And so we think about leveraging our sales process, it is getting better at qualifying our prospects, it's having deeper conversations, it's being systematic in our follow-up, and then it's about looking at relevant technology to leverage our sales process. So that wraps it up for, for me today, but thank you very much, and uh, I really enjoyed hanging out with you last night and sharing with you this morning. And I got time probably for a couple questions, just a quick question, if you have any. Any questions? I'll be hanging around too. That's a wrap, I'm gonna hop off stage. Thank you very much. Thank you.